All right, so to get us started, we'll just have everyone introduce themselves and I will start. My name is Catherine. I use they them pronouns and I am a eighth semester student at Berkeley College. I am studying composition and conducting. Um, my primary instrument is bassoon and I kind of owe my entire musical um, career to uh, public school education. I was raised in the public school system. Um, I was moved, I started out on saxophone and then I moved to bassoon when I was in the sixth grade. Uh, I started writing music around eighth grade and was really, really fortunate to have some people, um, you know, who were willing to play that and have that be performed. So I'm really grateful for those opportunities. Uh, started conducting when I got into high school and really loved it and been doing a mixture of both of those things since I got to Berkeley. And once I leave here, I really want to go and pursue a career um, in conducting concert music that really uh, focuses in on um, centering music of the African diaspora. So excited to see what that looks like. And I will hand it over to Maya. Cool. And actually, before I start, Catherine, can you tell us where you're from as well? Oh, yes. I am from Atlanta, Georgia, born and raised. Great. Okay. Um, before I get started, I just want to mention that Dr. Richard Carrick, the chair of composition at Berkeley, um, was supposed to be here with us, but couldn't make it due to an um, a unexpected event. So hi, my name is Maya Giles. Uh, I use the She series. Um, I am from Bowie, Maryland, so right outside of Washington, DC. Um, I am a violin performance major at Boston Conservatory. This is um, a senior, so my last year. Um, and actually I began my musical studies as a pianist. I began learning piano at my community center. And then I um, picked up violin in the third grade. So I'm also like a product of the public school system. Um, I was in art school from like elementary, middle and high school and ended up coming here to Boston Conservatory. And right now I'm more focused on being just a Western classical violinist and exploring other realms like music technology. So um, can I pass it on to you, Nate? Thank you, Maya. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nate. I use he and his pronouns. Um, I was born in the Philippines and grew up in Southern Maryland, so DMV in the house. Um, <laughs> started playing cello when I was 10. Um, and I started in the public school system also. Um, and when I graduated high school, I actually went to UMass Amherst for a year, um, studied with Astrid Schween, who's now the cellist of the Juilliard Quartet. Um, and then I transferred out, came to BOCO in 2011. Well, back then it was called BOCO, now it's called BCB. Uh, correct me, if, correct my acronyms if I'm wrong. <laughs> and um, so from 2011 until May of 2020 last year, I was a student at BOCO consecutively for almost a decade, four degrees. Um, to my understanding, I am still the current uh, record holder of most consecutive years and degrees at the school. Um, <laughs> From what I understand. Um, and um, I graduated uh, with my artist diploma from both uh, BCB in May of 2020 last year. And I've been just mostly doing teaching, um, freelancing um, a little bit with uh, some groups. Um, I play with Palaver Strings. I'm playing with the Far Cry next month. Um, and um, I'm also one of the co-founders of the Polaris Orchestra, which launched back in September last year. Um, and we basically what that is, is um, that's, you know, really what I'm putting most of my energy into um, right now, besides learning, you know, the entrepreneurship stuff, um, you know, is, you know, focusing on building, you know, an ensemble that gives voice to the unheard um, and really focusing on diversity, diversity initiatives. So very glad to be here. Great, thanks. I'll go next, I guess. Um, hi, I'm Rebecca Marchand. I teach music history at what I still call BOCO or AKA BCB. Um, and I'm also faculty director of the Etude Scholars, which is a group of faculty focused on um, diversity and equity initiatives for faculty mostly, but we also do some stuff with staff. Um, hmm. 
I started playing piano uh, at age seven, I suppose, or thereabouts. And I played pretty much continuously through high school. I took a brief hiatus. Um, and then I studied voice starting from about age 12. Um, when I got to college, I was an undeclared, probably foreign language major. I was going to be a diplomat. I wanted to be a translator for the UN. And I wound up being a music major instead. Um, so the language is still there. Oh, and I use she, her pronouns, as you can see on Zoom. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was really privileged in that I went to private school through sixth grade. And then I went to public school for junior high and for high school. And what I realized was like, what a lack of support there was for the arts um, in, the, and this is in Los Angeles. This is, I, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, so having that kind of contrast was very informative <laughs> to me. Um, and then in college, I went to a women's college and, and I can talk a little bit later about how that actually really opened my eyes to some issues of diversity in classical music. I guess that leaves me, right? <laughs> so I'm Marty Epstein, as I think probably all of you know, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and I have taught at Berkeley, and I still call them Berkeley and Boco, so I hope that's okay. Um, I've taught at Berkeley for 30 years and Boco for uh, 14 years. Um, I teach composition primarily at BOCO and I teach a mix of a whole bunch of things at Berkeley and Catherine is my student, I would just like to say, um, awesomely. Um, and so my story is, is a little bit long, so I'm gonna shorten it for right now because we'll probably talk about some of the stuff later. But um, the short version is that my dad is a musician, he's a jazz musician. And he also played bass clarinet in the Omaha Symphony when I was growing up and he had his own jazz um, big band, which did sort of avant-garde jazz, and then he had his own combo. And so there was music in my house constantly. And I gravitated to the piano from the time I was three, like everywhere there was a piano, I would be playing it. And started taking piano lessons, started taking clarinet lessons. And I, like, like a lot of you were saying, I am a product of the Omaha Public Schools and a very proud product of the Omaha Public Schools. I had music teachers who saw some sort of compositional thing in me and urged me into that direction. And I don't know where I would be without that. So classical music, Catherine and I were just talking about this yesterday. I hate that term. I would love it if maybe we could come up with a better term, but for right now, I'll call it call it what we all understand it to be. Classical music has always been where I gravitate, um, but classical music as how it's evolved into the 21st century. Did I answer all the questions? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually starting off on that point, Marty, it's clear that with all of us here, we've gotten our start through community, through our musical exposure, as well as um, support through a uh, school as well. So I guess I want to open up with this topic um, and this question. Uh, first off, what were your musical influences? And when did you first notice the lack of diversity in classical music? Anyone can take this. Um, I'll jump in right away and I'll try to be brief because I tend to talk a lot. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, um, noticed the lack of diversity in amongst my classmates when I went to college. When I started composing, it, it, I noticed that there weren't any women composers, but I also was not even aware of any living composers. So I was just like, I'm going to do this thing. I don't know what it is. I like doing it, so I'm just going to do it. And that's, that's sort of where I started. But when I went to college and I noticed that I was the only woman in the room, um, I was often the only, I went to the University of Iowa at first, I was often the only Jewish person in the room. Um, there certainly, when I was at Iowa, there weren't any composers or very few students of color also. So that's when I started noticing it. This was in 1978. So, 
and it's yeah well we'll talk about that more as we go <laughs> oh you want to know my influences i'm i'll get to that later i'll let someone else ask, answer the question i'll jump in um for me it was um i started noticing um, the lack of diversity in classical music until actually somebody actually pointed it out to me because I didn't actually even realize it until I was in high school when I was um because as I said I grew up in the public school system um, in terms of you know my education and uh, my music making so and when I was you know in like school orchestra and like some of the local like you know all county tri county I mean I'm sure it's different um in um, various regions but you know it, there was a lot of you know diversity it was just you know kids just being curious about you know different instruments, um, but I was one of the few that really like took it seriously and started looking into you know taking lessons and things like that. And so I actually had to um, you know do a lot of traveling outside of um, where I was in Southern Maryland to be exposed to you know higher levels of playing, um, you know conductors things like that. And that's when I actually knows noticed it for myself. And it was somebody had to point it out to me because. You know, growing up in that environment, I just assumed that you know, okay, this is this must be what classical music is like. So, but as I got as I progressed and got better, um, I noticed a severe lack um, of diversity, and I often found that I was the only one of any um, you know diverse background in the room or in any orchestra that I played with growing up. Um, so somebody actually had to point it out to me because uh, I was you know. Up until somebody pointed out to me, I was, you know, all, you know, ha ha he he, like I'm just here. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize it until, you know, someone actually pointed out, pointed it out. And then I started getting, um, you know, started dealing with all the issues that come with that. Um, so, and you also asked about influences, right? Musical influences? Sure, sure. But even then, I wanted to just add in, like, I know you and I, Nate, we come from the generally the same area. And I can also speak for myself where it's like, I didn't think much of it. It was just something I love to do. Um, and as far as my musical influences go, I was surrounded by, you know, gospel going to church, R&B, old school music, music that my parents were listening to, jazz, so all these African-American influences, but also knowing that, hey, I love playing violin and I'm studying the classical tradition and I love it. But I agree with you, Nate. I didn't really start thinking about it until you hit that point where you're clearly always the best person in the class. You need that challenge, but it's just this lack of resources. It's not within your community, but rather you have to go outside your community. Um, I know for me, that led to me going to Baltimore, which was an hour away, as opposed to me finding resources as in the region of DC. I mean, the mere fact that I live closer to the capital of the United States, and yes, the National Symphony Orchestra is there, the Kennedy Center is there, and one, I never felt welcomed in those spaces. Uh, economically, the concerts were way too expensive, so even if we, you know, we couldn't even afford to go there, nor did they really have any outreach programs for the DMV area, so the fact that I had to go to Baltimore, which was an incredible experience, um, and I got the support from there. The fact that that hour commute, as well as even going to Baltimore, the history of redlining there, um, the fact that I was going to this public arts performing school, which is, you know, it was incredible. But the fact that there was still, I noticed a huge difference between the white kids who tend to have better instruments better cases, went to Peabody Preparatory in addition to our art school as opposed to the black kids who are equally as talented, but we didn't have the higher level like equipment. We didn't have that extra extracurricular resources like going to summer music festivals or doing um, like preparatory orchestras in addition to our schoolwork. And I think that is where that's that crucial difference right that comes in because that helps elevate you to that next level and usually helps you get into the conservatories or the colleges so nay i can relate to that where it was like you you kind of have the same access but mostly not as well as the support is not equal um so and then also this other aspect of you live in this other musical tradition almost within your culture and this idea of having to choose between one or the other, 
to be accepted into one or the other or just be stuck in this middle space, you know? Um, so Catherine, actually, I would be curious to hear if you had very similar experience as well. Honestly, it's almost identical. Um, yeah, so it's like, I actually, the reason why I started playing an instrument is because I got into a magnet program and it was a school that was literally two bus rides away. Um, so it's like, you know, I had to wake up at like 5 a.m. to make sure I got to class at 8 a.m. kind of thing. Um, but it was a requirement that we played an instrument. And so it's like, I was literally forced into it and then picked it up, I loved it. And then as I started, you know, looking for more opportunities to do that, that's when the shift started. Cause my school was actually a very, very diverse school. They were really intentional about bringing students that lived in the area and the community that I came from. So like, that was something that I was actually really, really blessed to have was a very, very diverse experience in school from fourth grade on. But as I started to go outside of my school, that's when things really, really started to change. And I love how you guys started talking about like some of the things. And it's really interesting to see how some of the systemic factors that live outside of us come in and affect the classical music space. Because again, I play bassoon. For one, a lot of schools don't have school bassoons. And a real bassoon costs a lot of money, as Marty knows. And it's like, me playing bassoon up where I did, they had access to school bassoons, but if I were to have gone to the school down the street, they wouldn't have had a bassoon, nor probably a teacher that would say, why don't you try this out? Um, and then as I started, you know, I wanted to get lessons. I also had to travel about an hour and a half to find someone who taught bassoon lessons. Um, and then as I started to get into higher orchestras, you start to see how the narrative of the people who are in those spaces are so much different than the narrative of the people who are in your community that you're playing with every day. And that was something that stuck out really, really um, a lot to me. And that's when I really started to notice that I was the only person in the room. Like I've never played with another black bassoonist in my life. Like would love that for that to happen one day, but it's something that I've just never experienced. Um, and I, I caught on really quickly because I could start to see that it's like all these people are talking about their auditions and how they all have the same private lesson teacher. And I'm like, I took lessons for maybe like two months before it got too expensive and then just kept going on. So it's like, I'm grateful that I'm still here and to the people who got me here, but there were definitely a lot of things that casting me as an other in those spaces. Um, so we've talked a little bit about like those systemic factors that like have affected the classical music space, but I would like to like dig into that more. And like, why don't you guys share some of the things that you've seen like happening in the world that really affect the diversity um, in classical and concert music? Um, I, I'd love to speak to that if I can. Is that okay, Marty? Yeah, and then I want to, I'll, I'll talk after you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, you know, classical music, to my mind, does not exist um, or should not exist at the pleasure of the elite few. And we were just talking about the cost of classical music, um, whether that's going to concerts or paying for lessons or paying for an instrument. Um, you know, I think it's really... <laughs> you know, they always say follow the money, right? And like <laughs> the money is at the root of a lot of things. And um, so for me, that's, that's part of it. But I also think that the whole idea of the classical canon and the Western musical canon has been a history of taste making and taste making is connected to power and privilege since the Renaissance um, in the Western tradition, you know? So I'm kind of done with it. I'm just done with the whole idea of the canon. And what I would like to see, um, I heard um, Dr. Imani Mosley talk um, at a, a talk sponsored by Oberlin. It was online because it was pandemic time. Um, and she said, examples, not exemplars. And this is like my guiding light now as a music historian. When I pick repertoire to teach, is it because it's an example of what I'm trying to communicate in terms of what the music is doing? Or is it an exemplar of like some sort of canonical greatness and that's the reason we're listening to it? And if the answer is yes to that second question, I'm shifting that out. <laughs> Time for something new. 
So um, I agree with everything Rebecca said. Sorry, Dr. Marchand. <laughs> you can call me Rebecca. Call Rebecca. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, so there in my department at Berkeley, we're doing all this work to um, add pieces into our collective repertoire that we're going to teach and things like that. And, and that that's great, it has to be done. I think, so I, I have two things I wanna say, one about that, one about um, education. And the thing I wanna say about that is what I find with some of my colleagues and they're usually sort of older and I can say that cause I myself am older but they're usually sort of older and more stuck in their ways. You know, they say things like, well, we can't not teach Bach in counterpoint class. And I revere Bach. I have to just get on, on record as saying that but I think that it should never be not Bach, it should be Bach and, it should be Beethoven and, it should be, you know, it's, and that's, I think, what you, what you're referring to, one of the things you're talking about, Rebecca, when you talk about the, the canon, the canon does not have to be something etched in stone, I don't even like that word canon, it can be a whole messy, confusing, awesome body of stuff, so, so that's what I want to say about that, but for me as an educator, I'm so indebted to my high school band director because he saw a spark in me and he, he, never, he never had this unconscious bias thing where, well, she, she can compose, but I'm not going to encourage her. He, he said, you can compose and if you want to compose, you should compose. And, and this is my, I, I would say this is my reason for existence as a, as a composition professor. I want my students of any stripe to say to themselves, well, could I do this? I kind of, maybe I can do this. I want to find that spark and say, you can do it. And if you want to do it, you must do it. And um, I know probably most of you know who Taishan Sori is. He's a black composer who started his life as a percussionist. And now he's, he's trying to sort of single-handedly break down all these barriers between genres. And that's really the thing. That's really the problem, I think, is that this classical music term has become this rarefied genre of music that some people can have access to and some people can't. And we have to break down the walls and let everyone have access to it. And then I'll say one more thing. I tend to get a little long-winded, I'm really sorry. One more thing I'll say is that the Boston Symphony, for example, the, the organization down the street, which I love and revere, has so much money that they are fine. After the pandemic, they're fine. So they need to open their doors to make more of their concerts free. They can do that. They could get a rich person to underwrite that. They can and should do that because it's music that's amazing music that everybody should have access to. And thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Isn't that interesting, though, that the organizations that are doing the um, the outreach and that kind of stuff tend to be the ones that don't have the money, that it's like they're the struggling nonprofits, you know? So, yeah, it's time for those big elite institutions to step up. Yeah, I want to jump in here because there's like a lot of things that have been said that I really, really agree with. For one, the idea of a canon. I feel like that's so, so important and something that's so specific to the idea of like classical music but more so like classical western art forms because i can't say that i know dance or um like visual arts like that but i imagine that it's a very similar thing happening in those um spaces but this idea of canon it's like this at one time was popular music you know and so it's like that's something that has always like kind of like i've had to wrap my head around because it's like okay if this is popular music but this is like we hold it to the standard. We don't do that with like the, in the same way with popular music today. So what is it that is this driving force that makes this, you know, the sparkly and shiny classical music that we all have to spend so much money for. And it's like, it's what the white people at the top are saying is the canon. And it's like that in itself creates so many problems. And then when you kind of like hold on to this same idea and it's like, we try to maintain, like we try to, honor things by replicating them, you know? And it's like, that is something that can, it's a slippery slope and it can really, really soon become into something where it's like, 
okay, you're giving this all of this energy, all this venerance, but for what? And what are you venerating? Because there are a lot of these people that we study that probably didn't have, you know, the best, they weren't necessarily the best people or had the best ideas um, in mind. And so it's like, really thinking about this idea of like, what is it that we're, you know, glorifying in this space? Um, and the way that history like just plays into that, it's really, really interesting. And I think that that's something that's so good. And also the idea of, you know, what Marty, you said about having a high school band director that was able to see that in you. I had um, a, a director who was a black woman and she was very, very young. She, I think she was two years out of college when I met her. And like to this day, she is a person who taught me to conduct and someone that I look up to as like probably one of the greatest conductors I've ever seen. And it was like having her as a teacher is probably one of the reasons that I was able to hang on as long as I have. And I think it is so, so, so important for people who are entering this space as minority, you know, students um, to be able to have that kind of connection with someone in that space who is like, yes, it is hard. Yes, you are facing things that you probably don't quite understand yet and that are very, very difficult to navigate through, but know that you can do this and that, you know, it can all be worth it in the end. I think that is so important for students to have and, you know, not everyone has access to that in spaces like classical music. So just wanted to bring those up. Those are absolutely amazing points. Um, uh, I also want to ask you guys, how do you think that this manifests itself in the Berkeley and the conservatory communities here? Um, because we aren't immune to it. So I, I wanted to ask you guys what, what um, your thoughts are on that. Um, Nate, did you want to talk first? Oh, no, you can go ahead, Marty. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in after you. Okay. Um... I find at Berkeley, and this is not only about um, racial or gender issues, this is about almost everything. There, there's an institutional mindset where thing of this, I need to be careful because I know that people are going to see this, but people at Berkeley tend to like to put things into neatly recognizable categories. And so, you know, I've had colleagues say things to me like, wow, you wrote that piece yourself? You know, um, where is that coming from? What, is, what does that exactly mean? Um, honestly, when I started teaching at Boko, I felt like I had come home. I had felt like Boko was my, was my home. I was respected, recognized as being a composer who did you know something that was not easily categorizable and that was honored so and i haven't been there you know incredibly long and i certainly have not been a student there so maya and nate you probably have lots of other things to say but but at berkeley this is something that i have been fighting against for 30 years that you know if i feel it as a faculty member the students must be feeling it this this need to put everyone in this little nice category that we can then define you by. And that is, it's damaging to the creation of art, not only damaging to the creation of diversity in our genres. So that's, that's all I want to say about that. So um, I actually think um, my uh, particular perspective, because I have, um, because I was at Boco before the merger, during the merger, and then the merger, and then post merger, um, as well. So I'm seeing, you know, the shift, <laughs> you know, into you know where the institution is now. Um, is um, I like the direction that it's going, but um, you know, when I was coming up in the conservatory, and Catherine and Maya, I think you can um, sort of attest to this with your journeys as well. Um, I had to bust. Sorry, um, I have to work a lot harder. There we go. That, that's <laughs> I, I have to work a lot harder than a lot of my other colleagues just to get noticed, um, whether it be, um, you know, with chamber music performances or competitions, things like that. Um, you know, I had to put on a lot more work um, than my colleagues did um, just for the sake of, you know, getting something that people would 
um, consider, you know, respectable. Um, and I always found that um, at times difficult to deal with um, because I was, you know, I didn't understand it at times because like I'm putting in, you know, almost twice as much work and yet it's not getting noticed or it's just being glazed over. Um, and a lot of, you know, those incidences, you know, they, they really bring out your insecurities. Like for me, especially like I've constantly felt so insecure on my instrument, despite the amount of work that I was putting in or the amount of accolades that I was getting. It's like when I won the concerto competition in 2016, and then when I got to tango with people were still just like, Oh, okay. It's like, maybe he's actually, you know, doing something. I was like, what do you think I've been doing <laughs> for the past, you know, <laughs> you know, five, 10 years, you know, it's like, it's not, you know, a matter of, you know, me not putting enough work in, you know, it's just, why do I have to go through such lengths just to get noticed, you know, or even to be, you know, earn, you know, a certain amount of respect. Um, and that was something that, um, especially as I got into, when I started grad school um, at Boko, I really noticed that that was, you know, there was sort of like this shift of, you know, I suddenly, you know, I was used to just being, you know, you know, hanging behind the scenes, you know, just doing my own thing. But once the school started noticing that I was getting these accolades, it's like, oh, we have to, you know, plaster him everywhere and, you know, use his image to help with recruitment and stuff like that. And part of me was like, okay, like that's, I'm glad that, you know, they're taking initiative and showcasing me, but at the same time, why? You know, what's like the real intention behind that? Um, and no, don't get me wrong, like, Boko and Berkeley have done wonders for, for me in terms of my music making and my career and, you know, my connections and everything like that. Um, but if I'm going to be totally honest, there, there was this feeling of tokenization um, and just sort of wondering, you know, if I wasn't this complexion, you know, would they still notice me? Um, and May, was, I, I have <laughs> to jump in on that. Um, <laughs> we're well, reaching this we're reaching this in all these subjects we're coming to that same question of why right and nay i'm reminded of like the 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 phrase like black faces in high places and i'm also seeing this connection of um marty as you mentioned earlier the, this institutional way of thinking of boxing things and especially tightening up the box when things start to threaten it. I am reminded of how in all these circumstances, it's clear that Western, I'll call it Western classical music is very tied to white supremacy practices. That only is one of the only explanations that I can think of right now. And I think the issue is that it's, it's not that black and brown people aren't interested. It's more so that they are more likely to be discouraged, unsupported, and just even and put down, to be frank. Or even so, maybe, you know, I have also seen cases where black and brown people have abandoned their black and brownness to fit in. And I think that kind of makes things worse, right? And so it's just interesting to see the effects of this. Like we're seeing it in the sense of, oh my gosh, I'm looking around me and there's no black and brown people or women or BIPOC women or whatever like uh, intersections of these minorities you can think of. And you're seeing that the system's working, right? So like, I feel like the reckoning that we've had back starting back in 2020 is like with the Black Lives Matter and now like the Asian hate this year, which is, that's a whole different topic. I'm not going to get on that. But we're seeing how institutionalized racism is working because it's invisible. The, the effects we're seeing a bit around us, but the way that it's working is invisible. And so that comes in who we're studying in class, who is our classmates and our teachers, as well as people, professionals working in the career. So um, I will be interested to hear from everyone like how have you run into these issues within your career or perhaps, you know, as half of us are students, um, like within your studies? Um, Maya, I just want to say one thing about something you said like two minutes ago before anyone talks about that. I, I feel like when you're the only one, 
then there's the the danger that you can be tokenized. But what, Nate, what if there were 15 black cellists at Boko and you were the best cellist of all the cellists, black and white and green and, and everything else? I mean, I that's why I said earlier, my my goal as a teacher is to just get people to do the thing. Just get, you know, try to encourage. I have a student right now in my um, intro to composition class at Berkeley and she's black and she's from Atlanta actually and she's a violist and she only took the class because it was an in-person class and she didn't know what composing was and she's like writing incredible music. And the other day she said, I was kind of thinking I might want to be a composition major. And I said, yes, do it, do it. You have to be a composition major. So I think that's part of, it may take a while, but that's part of the answer to just, there needs to just be more, you know, then the white supremacy becomes lessened if there are more people who are not, um, not necessarily white. Um, anyway, I wanted to just make sure I said that before we moved completely off of that. No, thank you for mentioning. I oh, I'll, I'll let you go, uh, Dr. Mills. No, no, go ahead. Go. <laughs> um, yeah, I thank you for mentioning that, Marty. Um, I think that's great. I know we've talked about that student before, so I'm actually really, really happy to hear that. Um, and I'm glad that just with my experience, I'm glad that like you know she was able to to have that, um, and got that. So yes. Um, Something that I wanted to mention that you said, uh, Nate, about tokenization, because this is something that is coming up particularly now in the Berkeley community, now that, you know, things are a bit tense with um, a lot of the Black students, the queer students, um, just uh, minority students in general are, uh, are kind of, you know, really making their voices heard. And this is something that a lot of Black students have been particularly vocal about is the fact that Berkeley will really, like, use any and every opportunity to, like, showcase them to make it you know to put it on the promo and to be like oh we have a diverse school um and that's something that i feel like i also can speak to a little bit it's like nate you were talking about having to like work really really hard to be seen and it's like i've have seen that side but i've also seen people just immediately want to snatch me up because it's like i'm a black femme pr presenting person playing the bassoon you don't really see that every day and so it really does make for like you know a great promo shot and I don't want to say the problem with it comes with the fact that when it's like, okay, you're using a black face for this, but when you are, when the issues are brought to you, the, you don't really go about making change that will really get to those issues. You know, that is, I think, where a lot of the frustration with that lies. And I think that that is not necessarily specific to Berkeley, but is a bit universal when it comes to tokenization. It's the fact that it's like, you don't want to fix the issues. You just want to make everybody think that you fix the issues so that people will, you know, as Rebecca said, follow the money, give you their money. <laughs> so it's like that I feel like is like the key to like really changing that narrative. And I feel like as a community at Berkeley, we're not there yet. We'll see what happens, you know, with this, with everything that's going on. Um, but I think that's definitely um, a really, really big uh, thing to hit. Yeah, um, I'll let uh, Dr. Marshall speak now. Uh, Again, Rebecca's fine. <laughs> Um, but I do want to talk about like tokenism and how it intersects with my career. So that kind of get, dovetails us back to the, the question. Um, so a couple of things I'll say, like as these discussions of diversity have increased, and I would say maybe exponentially um, since last summer, um, one of the narratives I've been hearing that concerns me greatly is this idea that if we're going to have representation of people of color, that must mean jazz. Like that we've got to bring the jazz people into the repertoire lists, you know? And um, as someone who was raised on jazz, actually jazz and country music, <laughs> um, oddly enough, um, that like makes me angry because I think of all of my students who are people of color who want to play classical repertoire. And I think that space needs to be honored um, and, and not, there's just such essentialism happening um, in these discussions of diversity. But 
as far as like my career goes and, and tokenism, um, you know, I teach music history. So a lot, of, a lot of solutions have been, well, let's just plug some more black people into our syllabi and then we're good to go, you know? And like, no, <laughs> that's, that's not it. First of all, if you're gonna put somebody on your syllabus, you better have an authentic way of talking about their music not just like notice that they're a person of color. So for example, in Music History One, just this last year, I learned about Vicente Lusitano, who is a great um, example of late Renaissance chromatic wackiness, right? He makes Gisualdo look like Ode to Joy by comparison. Um, so, you know, so he's Afro-Portuguese and I put him in the syllabus. I dimmed the light on Gisualdo and I illuminated the light on Vicente Lusitano, and I talked about how he had been essentially erased from history by his contemporary, Nicola Vincentino, and there are all these politics involved. So I made the narrative about erasure. I made the narrative kind of foreground. Yeah, and yeah, Gesualdo has homicidal issues and all of that. So <laughs> I'm looking at the chat, um, but, I made, so what we did with Music History One is instead of kind of shifting or just sort of going through the motions of like, and here's the fraudula and here's the blah, blah, blah. You know, we are talking about the canon and its problems at the outset so that it interrogates constantly the, the repertoire and how that repertoire came to be, who's advancing that repertoire. Um, so I would say like as a music historian, the role that narrative plays is really now central to what I teach. Um, and so that means, you know, like if I'm teaching Ives, Charles Ives, um, St. Gowden's in Boston Common, well, yeah, we have to talk about the role of blackface minstrelsy and how Ives uses Stephen Foster songs and Stephen Foster songs were used in blackface minstrelsy. You know, so like, that has to be part of it and it can't be lazy, you know? And I just find a lot of efforts right now with this demand for quick fixes are lazy and performative and tokenistic. I could not agree with you more, Rebecca, um, because I'm, I've been in so many curriculum meetings where it's, okay, we're, let's, let's find, Let's find some Baroque music by Black composers so that our Black students will feel more welcomed. And I feel like that feels like a Band-Aid to me. That feels like, you know, I wouldn't feel more welcomed if I were, if I were in that situation. I think what could be very effective, um, Catherine, you mentioned Nina Simone in the chat a little bit ago, is to talk about how all Nina Simone ever wanted to do with her life was to play Bach in Carnegie Hall. That's all she wanted to do. And she was not allowed to do that. And she has all these interviews where she talks about how meaningful Bach was to her. That's something we can do. That's something we can do to show, first of all, how, how a composer like Bach could be relevant, relevant sorry, to everybody. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with you. It's no more Band-Aids, no more Band-Aids. I think this is incredible. Um, I'm curious to hear what made the recent change? Because these issues have always been here, but what was this turning point, especially within the last year where people are like, oh, wait a minute, this is a huge issue and we need to address it. Matt? Uh, I just, right from the get-go um, last year, May going into June during all the protests. Um, it sort of brought, you know, because I actually, I remember making a status about a very long status about how I, my whole thing was that why does it take such a huge event like that when these, like, like you said, um, these issues have been prevalent and happening for so long. Why, why now? You know, I mean, I'm saying that, um, um, hypothetically, but it's, you know, why, why did that have to be the catalyst, you know, to, you know, sort of snowball into, you know, all the different fields, um, and with our field specifically, um, of music making, it's, um, 
for me, it was it was that because um, once we saw, I mean, it was on the news every day. And then, of course, like social media just went totally, you know, it was like very just like out there, you know, in your faces every single day. Um, and especially during uh, June of last year, I remember like um, there was like all the anonymous music pages like Orchestra is Racist um, and, you know, those pages that were like basically outing people or just bringing attention to, you know, the issues that have been so prevalent for so long. Um, and yeah, for me, that was, I, I feel like that was the ultimately the turning point. Um, but it was in the process of that, it was great because, you know, now we're, you know, now we're actually able to sit down and talk about these issues. Um, I mean, obviously, like, like Marty said, we have to do better than just putting a bandaid on it. You know, we have to, you know, they're trying to, you know, treat the symptoms. They're not trying to cure the disease. Um, so yeah, I think that was definitely the, um, the turning point. Um, and it was great to see, like, um, even though I had graduated in May when school started up again in fall of last year, um, I remember like a lot of, you know, my friends who were still at Boko emailing me being like, did you see the audition list? And I'm like, no, no I'm not a student anymore. I don't go here anymore. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, but then they were telling me about like the audition repertoire and it was like, it's not diversified and all this stuff, all this other stuff. And I was like, wow, like that's, you know, the students are like taking a stand. You know, I, you know, within the, you know, the de almost decade that I was at Boko, I never really saw that type of upheaval of, um, you know, togetherness and the students coming together like that. That was very powerful. Um, so, yeah, that that for me was definitely the, the turning point. Yeah, I'm hearing the theme of the power of social media once again, starting social movements. And it's not just within the United States, it's also um, globally, we have seen the power of youth and social media being used to start change. Um, in addition to talking about what made this change, but also hearing like, what do you guys think the future may look like? After, you know, we're having these conversations, we're still in a pandemic. And I know a lot of people are making these predictions, especially related to the music industry and touring and, and whatnot and performances again. Um, we are gonna return back to it, but we're not gonna return the same. And there's been so much that's been brought to the table so far in just one year of the pandemic. I would love to hear everyone's opinion about the future and how that looks in the classical, Western classical music industry, and as well as just on the educational level and even within Berkeley and Boston, Boston Conservatory. I, I, no. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Catherine, go ahead. Oh, okay, um, yeah, I would love to answer this because this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot since Marty and I met yesterday. Um, because one thing that you said when we um, briefly spoke about this yesterday was, um, and you said it today as well, um, about having to break down the barriers, break down all of these genres. And honestly, I feel like that that is the only way that concert music, and I'm going to specifically say concert music because Marty, I know that's what you, and I'm, I'm kind of in that same, yeah. I think that the only way that concert music can survive is to step away from this because the way, the reason why it has been able to exist for so long is this, I, this, this hold of white supremacy that is so ingrained within the foundation of how classical music works. Literally just in the monetary sense, like that in itself is a form of white supremacy and the fact that you have to have access to this to be able to make it in this industry. Or if you don't have access to it, it becomes significantly more difficult. And I think that that tied with all of the other issues that kind of exist in the way that it lives now, it's kind of the idea where how can you reform something that from when it was built was not inclusive, you know? It's like there is nothing in the model for the way that classical music exists for it to be diversified. It's just not in the model of it. And I think that moving forward, really, we kind of have to accept this narrative of like, music is music, okay? Like we, uh, regardless of who is playing it, regardless of what your instrumentation is, regardless of all of the specifics, music is music. And we can come together to make all different kinds of music and we can, you know, group this into a classification of like, I guess a, 
a descendant in a way, but I think that we're really needing a moment where people are like, this isn't working. And I think we, a lot of people have been in that moment for a long time. And now it's a little bit more acceptable for people to say, this isn't working. And I think that, you know, last year played a really, really vital role in that, especially in these spaces like um, classical music and other high art forms, where it's like, it is acceptable now to be like, this isn't working versus maybe five years ago, if you were to say that you might lose your job. Um, so it's like, that was pivotal. And I think now that people are like, these are all of these problems. And there are so many people who have solutions, specifically black and brown people who have kind of had to like work against the system from the beginning, have solutions and things that are sustainable and things that are inclusive and things that, you know, really bring together community, which is what music at its core is really supposed to be about um, community and kind of bringing everyone together in that shared experience. I think that when we start centering that as opposed to a canon, as, as opposed to all the things that we're trying to glorify, that just opens up the door to something that is just so unlike what we where we've been, but so much more open and um, there's just so much more space for everyone to like exist in that. And I think that's the direction that most people want to go in. It's just a matter of, you know, will the powers at large allow that to happen? Catherine, I would love to briefly touch upon that if I can. Um, I, I hear you when you say music is music and that is exactly how I see it. And I've been thinking a lot about this because I, as a, as a woman, I've, and somebody who went to a woman's college, um, which by the way, I had men in all my classes and whatever, it wasn't like a convent. Um, but, uh, you know, I think about like these concerts of all women's music or all black composers concerts or all this or all that. And I think in the short term, they're necessary. They're necessary to increase visibility because there has been so much erasure. But my goal, my long-term like vision, hope, dream is that it won't matter someday. And, and one of the things that I've done, I teach a graduate seminar and I won't say the name of the graduate seminar because it's my secret, but um, it has a topic and every single person we talk about, every single performer and every single composer in that seminar is a woman. But women is not in the title, it's not in the course description. It says composers and performers. And, and there are BIPOC women, there are white women, <laughs> there, you know, because why should it be the norm that we have to make an exception and say, oh, and we're talking about women too? Like it should just be okay if we can talk about all men in a class, we can talk about all women in a class without that being the big deal. So uh, you know, I struggle with this because like, I would love to see us just get to the point where you go to the BSO and you're like, oh, cool, Shostakovich, Toru Takamitsu, Pamela Z, Margaret Bonds, awesome, great program. Boom, that's the long-term goal for me. That's the long-term goal for me too. And one, one thing I wanna say about that, um, Rebecca, is um, you probably know about the Ludovico Ensemble because they started their life at, at Boco. And about four years ago, they did a whole season that was all just women composers and they never said it. They never said this is women composers. I have one little um, beacon of hope that I want to try to inject in because I think it's impossible to see change when you're in the middle of it and while it's happening. But when I started at Boco, um, and, and Berkeley is a separate issue. So I'm just going to talk about Boco for a second. Um, when I started at Boco, there was one black composer student, and then he graduated, and then there was another one, and then he graduated. And now we have four. Okay, so that may not, and, and, and three of them are women. And so that may not seem like a lot, but, and I'm not very good at math but I think it's like a lot, a lot, you know, percentage wise. And I don't know if it's because our chair is black. I don't know 
you know, if students feel more comfortable applying to BOCO because they know that, I don't know why it is. But what I'm seeing is when we do auditions and interviews every year, we have more students of color applying. And for me, you know, as I think I said right at the very beginning, that's the, in addition to what Rebecca was saying about eventually no more women composers concerts, no more black composers concerts, um, no more men composer concerts, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the, the key is to have those 15 black cellists, to have, you know, a full section of black non-male identifying bassoonists, just have the sheer number so nothing looks unique anymore, but everything looks normal and wonderful. That's, that's my goal. Wow, that's interesting when you talked about the fact that there are four Black composition students now, because I'm reminded that, and Nate, you could probably speak on this, my graduating class, like, as I entered as a freshman, there was four string students, four Black string students, including me. And I remember, Nate, you, you had talked about, you know, in a separate conversation years back, how that made you feel, especially like you were still at the school, you were still studying and, and to see four Black string students coming in. And we have seen now that that's been increasing with um, people underneath me. Nate, I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so um, again, because of my long track record um, at, <laughs> at the school, you know, I remember when I first came in as a freshman, I actually remember having to De deliberately like hunt down the other uh, black students at school and not just in the music department, but also in the musical theater department and the dance department as well. But you know, fast forward to, you know, 2019 and 2020, there's a huge increase, um, you know, of black students at the school. Um, and I noticed it, especially in the last few years of um, when I was at BOCO, because I had joined uh, the Black Student Alliance um, as well. And I really got to, you know, connect and you know, interact with the other students, uh, the other black students. Um, and actually I remember um, Maya, your class specifically, I remember, cause I remember hearing about four incoming string students. And I just, I remember just being like so excited, you know, about that. Um, so, but um, in terms of like increasing the diversity, I think, and that's part of the reason why I actually, you know, with the help of my friend, Jaman and uh, Gabby, the other co-founders of uh, Polaris Orchestra, we, you know, our goal is obviously, you know, to help diversify, you know, classical music in general, but our actual, you know, the aim right now that what we're going towards is going towards, you know, Gen Z and the generations after. Because um, obviously, you know, we, we are aware of all the professionals like right now at our, you know, at our level, like currently, but if we really want to see long term generational change, we have to start exposing the young the young kids you know from ages you know from three upward you know we have to change the image that we were brought up in you know we have to be inclusive of all types of music you know not just hold classical music on this you know you know godly pedestal that it's been you know holding for centuries um so we have to you know that's really you know and not just my organization but people just everybody in general we can start you know you know from the younger generations and within the next decade or two we'll start to see you know more diversity in the concert hall more diversity in the repertoire um and just more representation in general um so and you know, of course these things will it'll, it'll take time you know this is you know everyone's looking for the the overnight fix this is not an overnight fix um but you know it's you know again rome wasn't built today so we have to be patient you know, and I, I know that because like, I'm one of the most impatient people on the planet. So I'm learning, you know, this, you know, patience and, you know, and just trusting the process, um, you know, as we go, you know, this, the smaller steps will eventually, you know, lead to bigger steps, you know, over the course of time. So. Awesome. Well, we are at 501. I think that's a great way for us to end. But if anyone has any other comments they want to mention or I mean, feel free to take that space now. Yeah, I Thank just want to say this is like the best Zoom meeting I've been in since the pandemic started. 
Thank you for this opportunity, truly. And it was just a pleasure to, to meet you, Catherine. Um, and I know Nate and Maya, um, and it was great to see you both. And, and honestly, like for me, I learned so much, right? Like just having the opportunity to hear your voices speak was very important to me. And of course, Marty, always a pleasure. Likewise, Rebecca, I miss you a lot. I miss you too. <laughs> we live seven minutes apart from each other. <laughs> but we don't. <laughs> but we don't. Have. It's a private joke. <laughs> I love this. I'm just so glad that I think this is important to create space to exchange, to have conversations and just learn from one another. So I'm, I'm really thankful for everyone being here. Yes, same. It was so good to meet you, Rebecca and Nate. Um, it was great to engage with this conversation. I agree. I think this is one of the best meetings I've also had on Zoom. Um, so yeah, I want to thank you all so much for your time. I'm going to stop recording now.